So, today I present to you my obscure, creepy slash horror anime and manga iceberg. However, there are a few caveats. This iceberg is of my own creation, and as a result, the few final layers may be skewed by what I believe is popular in the anime and manga fandoms. The deeper the layer, the less popular I believe the series to be. Also, this kind of goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway. As we're talking about obscure anime and manga, the further down the list we go, the likelihood that the series being discussed has an anime adaptation is less likely, simply due to the fact that if a manga is obscure, there won't be enough fans of it to warrant an anime adaptation. So as a result, the further down the list we go, the more and more manga-only series you will see. With all that out the way, here is my creepy anime and manga iceberg, and I hope you enjoy. Layer number one, the stuff you've heard of. Tokyo Ghoul. Tokyo Ghoul is a popular anime and manga series, and for good reason. I myself have even made a video on it in the past. Despite this, however, I feel like a lot of its creepiness is lost in the anime adaptation, especially due to its censorship, as well as a multitude of other reasons, hence why it's so low on the iceberg, or high. But overall, that doesn't stop the core concept of ghouls being an inherently creepy and disturbed concept. They're the equivalent of modern vampires that can consume any part of your body to grow stronger instead of solely relying on someone's blood. They also have skin stronger than steel, can regenerate almost indefinitely, and have extra appendages that can rip you limb from limb. The manga also has some incredibly good panels, especially of body gore and body horror, especially early on. On top of that, the idea of having someone else's body parts transplanted into you and causing you to completely change on a biological level is a very body horror-esque fear and kind of inarguably very creepy. Helsing slash Helsing Ultimate. Speaking of vampires, Helsing is a series centered around vampires and is arguably the most prolific series to do so. It's fair to say that Helsing is relatively popular given the fact that it has its original version from 2002 and a remake, Helsing Ultimate, which was made in 2006. The series itself, however, centers majorly around vampires, ghouls, werewolves, pretty standard concepts. However, the majority of creepiness and spookiness in Helsing mainly exudes from one particular thing, the titular Alucard himself. He's more in the realm of a Lovecraftian entity that you can't understand more so than a simple vampire. How can you look at something like this and simply chalk it up to a normal run-of-the-mill vampire? Soul Eater. Okay, when you look back and you think about how you remember Soul Eater, you probably don't remember it being that creepy or scary. I beg to differ. Soul Eater as a series overall isn't creepy, well, at least in the anime's second half when it departs from the manga, but overall some things about Soul Eater are just downright creepy. Most prolific of all, madness. Just the concept of it. We see characters have complete character shifts as they slowly grow insane. We get into characters' minds as they have hallucinations that haunt them to the point of literal madness. There are also other things that are creepy, such as Ashura becoming reborn. The concept of Ashura having his own skin being ripped off and used as his own prison is just haunting on its own. If you aren't sure about whether or not Solita is creepy or has any scary moments, just go back and watch scenes with Ashura early on when he gets free. That might change your opinion, because that stuck with me for a while. Chainsaw Man. Chainsaw Man is getting really popular and for good reason, and the latest chapter just came out as of me recording this video. It has good action, intriguing world building, and a relatable main character, while at the same time having some really creepy moments scattered throughout. The things that come to mind off the top of the head for most people would be things like the Darkness Devil that would just immediately come to a fan's mind if they like the series. However, things such as the Future Devil, the Halloween Devil, or just some of the designs of the Devils are downright creepy and horrifying. It isn't a horror manga by any means, but that doesn't mean it lacks some creepy and horrific moments. Mainly the Darkness Devil, if I'm honest, but that seemed to stick with most people who read the manga. I mean, just look at all these cool edits and animations of the Darkness Devil. Also, some of the focal concepts in Chainsaw Man also really intrigue me in a dark way. In a world where devils are created based around people's perception of them and how afraid people are of it, what does the death devil look like? What does the hunger devil look like? If they're anything like the darkness devil, they're going to be haunting to say the least. Terraformers. Terraformers is genuinely quite unsettling to me. Well, kind of. Just one thing in particular is unsettling. The main antagonists for a good chunk of terraformers, the cockroach men. Just look at these dudes. They're some of the most uncanny creatures I've seen in all of fiction. Uncanny is the perfect word, in my opinion, as I feel like 
these monstrosities fit quite comfortably in the Uncanny Valley, but not only are these creatures Satan's hell spawns, they're also super durable, super fast, and super strong. So if you have a nightmare about them, you're sure as hell not going to be able to outrun them. The anime does suffer from some terrible censorship though, like laughably bad censorship, even worse than the censorship in the first seasons of Tokyo Ghoul, somehow. However, both the uncensored anime and manga have some really brutal gore to complement the terror of these creatures. Just the concept of humans trying to terraform another planet and being met with these creatures is just downright disturbed. Elfin Lied. <laughs> yeah, I kind of have to put this on here. Elfin Lied feels like it's been on every basic white bread YouTube channel's top 10 list for most disturbed anime for like the past 20 years, somehow. And to be honest, I can't really fault those channels. Elfin Lied has some brutal and disturbing moments in it, almost nonsensically brutal for no reason at some points. I mean, in one of Elfin Lied's most prolific scenes, a dog is murdered, like, brutally with a vase by school children simply because the dog's owner was happy like whose children are this cruel while at the same time you also have some really good gore such as the prison break scene or on the train like overall elfin light has some very brutal violence and is a show i feel that most if not all weebs should start with if they want to get into horror and disturbing anime and manga because it's not overly complicated and it's got good gore parasite the maxim Parasite creates a similar feeling of dread in me as Tokyo Ghoul. The mere idea that your own body is not your own, that your own organs and limbs aren't yours, they belong to something else, not someone, something that isn't human. It's a very real fear. Overall, the show is very much not 100% horror, most of the time. I mean, to be honest, the least horror thing about this show is its main OP. Unfortunately, the main opening fits the tone of the show like a club fits a seal but it, I'll give it a pass because it's an absolute banger. But the show does have some well-crafted and creepy moments. The show starts off as simply someone losing control of their arm to an alien. Simple enough, but then it quickly evolves into the invasion of the body snatchers or scanners where aliens are everywhere, hidden in society, lurking in the shadows. It's a concept as old as water, but it works very well in being creepy. Mirai Nikki. Okay, Future Diary is pretty light on the creepy moments, but there are a few earlier in the series. I mean, I watched this show a couple years after it released when I was like 13, 12, 13, and for some reason, this shot always stuck with me. I mean, the concept of the Yandere was popularized with this show, and by proxy, you know Gasai. She kind of popularized the trope of the Yandere in anime for a while, but if you're a sane human being, Yandere should creep you out and not make you horny. When I first watched this when I was 12, like a lot of impressionable young weebs, I thought Yandere's were cool. Now I'm an adult and they're fucking disturbed. However, there is an exception to every rule. So yeah, Mirai Nikki has some creepy stuff with you know, but to be honest, the creepiest thing about Mirai Nikki is the fandom surrounding it. Another. Now. Finally, an actual horror manga that was created for the sole purpose of scaring you, or at least creeping you out. Another is a series that is known for two things in my opinion. This girl being confused with this girl, because they look kind of similar. And the other thing it's known for is um, the umbrella scene. And that's for good reason. These characters are pretty much identical and the umbrella scene is really fucking unsettling. Another has plenty of scenes like that, on top of a genuinely creepy and mysterious atmosphere. Another is a great show to get you in a horror and mystery anime. It's just a great show overall. Yes, I know it started as a light novel, but I prefer the moving cartoon instead of the static book. School days. <laughs> nice boat. Okay, now that I got that out the way for the weeby boomers, let's talk about school days. This series isn't really that disturbing or creepy overall. However, the ending is such a random, disturbed curveball that I felt like I needed to mention it on this list. The show for the majority of its run is about a high school kid who's dating every girl in a 50 mile radius. At the same time, fair enough. Bit of a dick move, but overall this sounds like a pretty milk toast concept. But you could probably do something with it if there was a good writer behind it. it seems pretty boring and whatever, but once we reach the final act of the series, shit just jumps from 0 or 100 so goddamn fast. Just... Okay. You've probably heard of School Days before, but all I'm going to say to you is just watch like 
the final two, three episodes, and you'll see what I mean. It just, it's a stock, whatever, romance, kind of, and then it just, it just spins so fast in the last couple episodes. Just, you've probably seen it on a Watch Mojo list or before, whatever. Berserk. There is an easy joke that I could make about how Berserk 2016 and 2017 are the scariest things ever. Just look at funny guts walk. <laughs> But Berserk kind of means too much to me to actually like go for that joke and actually try and make that funny because it's, it's not. We know how bad Berserk 2016 and 2017 are already. Berserk as a series has grown more popular than it ever has within the past couple years, hence why it's so high on this iceberg and it's just a ridiculously popular series overall. One reason for its more modern popularity is the release of Elden Ring, causing an influx of new readers of Berserk. And another reason for its popularity booming is the death of its author, Kentaro Miura. Berserk as a series covers every disturbing topic you can think of. To be honest, the topics that I listed in this video's disclaimer are pretty much all covered in the Lost Children's arc alone of Berserk, which is my personal favourite arc. I'll show a couple panels now, but I can't show too much because they're just too brutal. Berserk is one of the darkest series I know of and I'm glad that most people into anime and manga have heard of it. And if you didn't know, I've also got a tattoo from Berserk on my back because it just it means that much to me. I love Berserk. Give it a try. It's pretty good. Layer 2. The stuff you've probably heard of. Now we get to the layer where you've probably heard of these stories but whether or not you've seen them or read them is determined by how much of a weeb you are or how much of a horror fan you are. Nothing too hardcore yet, but there's still some disturbing stuff here nonetheless. Higurashi When They Cry, also known as Higurashi no Naku Koro Ni, also known as When the Cicadas Cry, or Higurashi When the Cicadas Cry. It has a lot of different names. So let's just go by Higurashi. Higurashi is one of my personal favourite series for good reason. I've even talked about it in this video I made a long time ago. But shame filled plug aside, all those warnings at the beginning of this video most of them are within the Higurashi series, and you probably have a couple extra topics that I forgot to mention. There's a reason this series ends up on a lot of weeby top 10 lists, and the best part about it is every version of the story is different. The anime is an adaptation of the visual novel, the manga is also an adaptation of the visual novel, yet despite that fact they all tell a very different story, which has its positives and negatives. There's also on top of that a live action, but Let's not talk about that, okay? What Higurashi actually is, in essence, is a mystery. In the beginning, we follow the narrative of Keiichi, a city kid who has just moved into this small little village called Hinamizawa, which um, actually exists, by the way, but the only way I can put it is an insanity happens. I genuinely don't want to say any more than this, so you can enjoy it to the fullest with as little spoilers as possible besides these out-of-context clips on screen. Go watch Higurashi, or play it, or read it, or Play it again. Oh, what the fuck is this? You mean Echo when they cry, or when the seagulls cry? It, it sounds similar, right? Yeah, for good reason. You might not be able to tell immediately, but these series are very different from each other while also being very similar. It's because they're created by the same person. Who would have knew? But you mean Echo in its own right has its own creepy and disturbing moments and atmosphere. The series itself focuses around a murder mystery in a remote mansion. It's literally just like a horror version of Ace Attorney with some occult imagery, but as the series continues and some more murders maybe happen, the murders become harder and harder to explain, and the series evolves into a debate whether or not an evil witch has caused these crimes, or whether or not the witch even exists to begin with. It gets really complicated, really obtuse, but it's also really good. And on top of that, it also has a fighting game. It's surprisingly okay. Serial Experiments Lane. Yeah, this show is weird, and it's kind of infamous for that reason. I'm going to try and word this section in a way that doesn't spoil anything, whilst also trying to give you a taste of how strange and outlandish Serial Experiments Lane is, but to be honest, the show is so weird it's kind of hard to spoil anything, just, just given how balls to the wall it is, okay? So it's kind of like the plot of a uh, Perfect Blue, kinda if it happened to a gamer girl in junior high instead of an idol, but like the internet gods are also like fucking with the world in like the real world, but not just like in the online. Like, okay, this show is just a trip and requires like a, a good watch. Like it, your attention has to be on the show to try and understand it, and or to even understand me. One thing I will say for sure about Serial Experiments Lane is that it feels like Perfect Blue in the sense that it feels very, very ahead of its time. 
monster. On a completely unrelated note, you know how in like Spy Family, how Lloyd can just kind of wear other people's faces immaculately and just completely hide in plain sight in any scenario. He's just he's just always there at any time. Yeah, that's that's cool. Anyway, Monster is really good and interesting. Sometimes foreshadowing is relatively obvious. This series is written by Naoki Urasawa, who has another series on this iceberg and is synonymously known by seinen and joyers as one of the goats of seinen anime and manga and for good reason monster being one of them despite what some shitlords on twitter tiktok and just overall contrarians might tell you monster as a story is incredibly intriguing and delves into some quite disturbed themes but give it a go yourself it's rated so highly by the majority of seinen anime and manga fans for good reason, as I will do with a lot of the entries on this iceberg. If the story revolves around a mystery, I'll keep a lot of the plot to myself, just so you could enjoy the anime and manga in its full entirety with as little spoilers as possible. Blood Plus. Blood Plus starts in the Vietnam War. I, I think, but with some added anime mystery spice added. We have these creatures which are messing up the population of this small village, as well as this lovely girl with a janky ass katana who is just slaying everyone around her. Flash five minutes forward and we have this peaceful ass shit. Five minutes after that, shit hits the fan again. Creepy monsters and the such. Overall the show contains a lot of gore and blood, plus some intriguing plot. The show is about this gun grave looking dude who follows the perfectly normal and boring girl with nothing of note about it. As I say, a decent girl and a decent show overall. However, don't get it mixed up with Blood Sea. It's Ugly Cousin. It's a worse show overall. Shiki. Shiki is another one of my personal favourites off this iceberg, probably because it gives off some similar vibes to Higurashi. It takes place in a rural Japanese village as mysterious occurrences take place, people suddenly becoming faint, growing ill and dying. Whenever people get these totally unidentifiable holes in their neck, they slowly fade away and die. It must be mosquito bites, I guess. Newsflash, it's vampires that live under your bed right now. Don't, don't look. They're, they're, shh, shh. Like a lot of series on this iceberg, the manga has some beautiful artwork that suits the aesthetic of Shiki's narrative and story. And said story can get quite brutal at some points. And, uh, spoiler alert, this, this, this show can make you feel bad for blood-sucking neck pokers just because of how brutally some of them are killed. I mean, you see some of them melt in the sun and it's not pretty. Shiki on a whole is just a good and tense horror mystery. Give it a go if you like horror. I really recommend this one. I mean, it'd be weird if you were watching this video otherwise, to be honest. Inspector. If I'm honest, I feel like this show is like the most non-horror on this iceberg. The main reason it's here is for a few disturbing moments, as well as its general themes revolving around Japanese yokai, and those can be kind of spooky. Besides those, the show is relatively tame most of the time. It has bits and pieces of gore and horror sprinkled throughout though. The show itself is about a boring anime protagonist and this disabled girl, and we follow them as they help, hurt or hide from yokai. It does have some disturbing moments, as well as some half-decent gore that comes from the main character's powers, but nothing too special, but overall a decent watch. Corpse Party You ever just do a demonic ritual just so you and your BFFs from school don't forget about each other? No? Well... These guys did, and on top of that, they kind of ballsed it up. So, you know, now they're all separated between different layers of purgatory that are just all controlled by a little ghost girl who has a strange infatuation with turning perfectly human, perfectly healthy children into puddles of gore and mental anguish. Maybe that's, maybe that's just a you thing. I feel like most people have done that. It's kind of like Higurashi, the more I think about it. If you've heard of Corp's Party, it's probably from uh, the funny bridge man because he played it years ago and it got a little bit of attention back then. Holy shit, if you remember that, you are old. <laughs> oh my god, I'm old too. Anyway, Cobb's Party as a series has a surprising amount of spin-offs, light novels and manga. However, if you just like to watch it, you have a four episode OVA series, so give the games a go, if not, give the anime a watch. But just <laughs> make sure to skip the live action. Hellgirl. Hellgirl is a pretty novel concept and is overall pretty simple. Is there someone in your life who you absolutely despise? A bully? A family member? An ex-partner perhaps? Anyone really? Well, give this lovely lass a bell and she'll sort it out for you. But exchange, she wants, you know, she wants what every woman wants. Uh, yeah, you guessed it. 
health insurance. <laughs> yeah, just just kidding. It, it's your soul. Wait, hold up. Did, do you need health insurance in Japan? Let me check. Oh, shit. I guess you do. Me saying a very unfunny line led me into learning something. So, yeah. Your soul. Hell Girl is more of like an episodic series as we go through different people who contact the Hell Girl who take revenge for them. And it's quite an intriguing little watch, to be honest. Nothing too complicated, but good for avid horror fans. It gives off, you know, very pale girl with black, black long hair. You no know, Juwan grudge kind of vibes, that kind of stuff. If you like the grudge, if you like that kind of stuff, you'll enjoy this. Claymore. One quick thing out the way before I actually talk about what Claymore is. If you've ever read Berserk, you've probably heard this a thousand times, and it annoys me. Whenever you get caught up with Berserk, just just try out Claymore, it's the same stuff. Yeah, they're both dark fantasies centering around characters with large swords and a decent amount of gore. That sounds, you know, very similar, but themes, story, etc. is very different from Berserk. Mostly. I don't know, it's just like a comparison that's existed since Berserk's manga was stuck on the fucking board. And it, it's just a comparison that always seemed way too common of an opinion to me. But, I mean, if CBR puts it at the top of its list, you know it's a boring opinion to have. Anyway, tangent aside, what actually is Claymore? <laughs> I hate myself. It's pretty much the Witcher mixed with Berserk. <laughs> big swords, big women, big monsters, big people who are monsters. And in my opinion, and other people's opinion, a lot of people say the manga is far superior. Well, I say other people. It's pretty much just this one specific friend who swears by the manga saying that's far better. So just keep his opinion in mind if you decide to give it a go. But in my opinion, both the anime and the manga are a pretty decent watch. Some pretty good, dark, disturbing fantasy. Madoka Magica. Gen the Butcher, or Gen Rabuchi, you know, the person who's behind some of the more messed up stories in light novels, anime, and manga. He wrote Psycho Pass, Saito Uda, and I don't know, Zero, yeah. But, however, his most famous work, arguably, is Madoka Magica, this show. Just like School Live, which is a spoiler alert, the next entry, has a lot hiding under the surface. It looks like most typical shoujo anime when you first start. Cute, magical girls defeating monsters with the power of friendship and muskets for some reason, but a few episodes in the series, it, uh, it kind of, it just kind of goes insane and shit hits the fan really fu- like the fan's gone, the fan's out the window, it just hits the fan. Yet again, I'm going to be vague here for the sake of spoilers. It might be very annoying that I keep not talking about the plot of these, but this isn't just an iceberg, it's also a recommendation, so I highly suggest this one if you're curious. School Live or School Live? I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie, I'm not sure about the name. Is another piece of work from the mind of Gen Rabuchi, and in my opinion, it's a very intriguing and novel concept for a series. And to be honest, it feels like this concept should have been explored by a lot more anime and manga by now, but anyway. School Live is a story about our main character, Yuki, just going on a perfectly normal slice of life, white bread, standard school journey. Going to school lessons, seeing friends, going to extracurricular clubs, etc. Standard slice of life fair. However, there's one big problem. It's not quite what it seems more than meets the eye. I'm just gonna leave it at that because the first episode has a really nice twist at the end of it and I just want you to see that for yourselves. Just give the first episode of this show a go and if you're intrigued by the end of it, trust me, it should at least grab your attention and you should enjoy the series overall. And apologies again for being vague, I just want you to experience these pieces of work to the fullest. Perfect Blue this entry and the one after are intrinsically linked as they both came from the grey matter of this beautiful bastard, Satoshi Kon, Rip the Homie. A man who was known for his surrealist imagery and plots, as well as his work being very ahead of his time. And that is exemplified most prolifically, in my opinion, in one of his most popular works, the aforementioned Perfect Blue. Since Perfect Blue is a movie and not a series, it's not very long and very easy to get into. However, as it is a movie, I don't want to spoil a lot. Shocker, I know. However, I'll discuss some of the themes that the film does dive into. 
despite coming out in 1997, Perfect Blue delves into some of the duality of people in modern society by looking at the difference between how people wish to be perceived, our personas, and how different our actual personalities and us overall are different from our ideal versions of ourselves. And as the modern world grows more and more focused on our personas, more so than our true selves, this piece of media grows more and more timeless and intriguing. I highly, out of all of these, this is one that I put close to the top of suggestions from this iceberg. You could tell that due to the fact that there's no joke here, it's, it's just my honest opinion. And on top of that, the movie is incredibly disturbed and just horrifying in so many moments so trust me if you like horror if you want to be disturbed and freak the fuck out perfect blue is a great choice paranoia agent i put both this and perfect blue on the list as they're my favorite two pieces of work from satoshi Kon. yes all his other work is really good, like Paprika and Tokyo Godfathers, but out of his work, I find Perfect Blue and Paranoia Agent to be the most disturbing, timeless, and overall fascinating. And on top of that, I didn't want to put every single one of his works on the iceberg, so I, I only chose a couple. Paranoia Agent is like Hellgirl, isn't that the fact that it's a very episodic series. We focus on different people as they all get assaulted by this mysterious attacker, known only as little slugger and we follow the victims before during and after their attacks seeing how their lives have changed due to their assault but as i said earlier it's a satoshi Kon piece so it's not that simple yet again with a lot of other picks on the list i'll be talking very little about the plot so that you will actually watch it and avoid as many spoilers as possible yet again just tr if it's satoshi Kon, it's worth the watch in my opinion that's just a good rule of thumb to have Layer 3. I'm not sure if you've heard of these. We've now arrived halfway down the iceberg. We've reached the point where the likelihood you have read or watched all of the series here is starting to get lower and lower. And whilst I feel a lot of people may have heard of these series, there are quite a few here that everyone has heard of if they're in a disturbing anime manga, but not all horror or disturbing anime manga fans have watched or read them. We'll start off with something somewhat popular among the manga horror community. Junji Ito slash Uzumaki slash Tomie, etc. I've put all of Ito's work in one section on this list as the man has made way too many horror manga masterpieces for me to count on this list. I know any horror fan worth their salt may be hearing about the placement on this list and snorting at the fact that Junji Ito and his works are at the third layer of this list and not higher because they may feel he's a lot more well known. That's true, but personally I feel whilst a lot of his works like Uzumaki, Gyo, Tomie, you know, stuff like that, his more popular works, whilst they are obviously bangers, a lot of Ito's just as horrifying works goes fairly underappreciated. Most notably for me would be stories like Amigara Fault, which is my personal favourite, Hellstar Remina, The Long Dream, The Hanging Blimps. Junji Ito has more to his repertoire than people recognise. He has plenty of stories just as, if not more spooky, than Uzumaki and will eventually get the Adult Swim animation of Uzumaki at some point in the future, which looks cool. But, just with, like with a lot of places on this list, don't check out the live action, and on top of that, it goes without saying that, this collection is absolute dog sh**. Miyako-chan. Miyako-chan as a series came out relatively recently, when compared to a lot of the other entries on this list only coming out in around 2021, and on top of that, the core concept of this story is an age-old tale. One person can see ghosts, and no one else can. It's pretty much the same as The Sixth Sense, but give the main character much, much, much creepier ghosts to look at instead of Bruce Willis's glorious visage. And by the way, spoiler alert, yeah, Bruce Willis is a ghost in The Sixth Sense. If you haven't seen it by now, you weren't gonna watch it to begin with, let's be real. In regards to Miyako-chan, I feel like it's, it was kind of slept on. Only a little bit given the fact that it's a horror title, but all I have to show you to entice you about the show is its artwork, both in the anime and in the manga, it's been translated and portrayed in the anime really well, so feel free to check out one or the other. You won't be missing out much by picking one format and not the other, which is quite rare for anime adaptations. Overall, it's a title with some very spooky ghosts and spirits, and it's pretty cool. And I love the fact that her name is derived from Miru, or Mieru, which means to be seen in Japanese, which is ironic considering the fact that she gets asked that question a lot in this series. 
Kemono Jihen. Before I started watching this show, I saw a lot of the promotional art and it gave off a very My Hero Academia vibe from the posters, so I ignored it for a while. Then I saw some clips on YouTube and then I got kind of intrigued and I decided to pick it up because I saw some yokai and stuff. Despite the appearance of this show on the surface being kind of whatever, this show gets surprisingly dark, like what the f- All that just for some spider silk? God damn. The plot mainly centers around this wacky cast of kids who are actually creatures mainly from Japanese folklore. Kemono, basically just meaning like beastly or like animal yokai. This kid's immortal and feels no pain and goes Super Saiyan God for some reason as well. Kind of cool. Uh, this kid is pretty much just Spider-Man and can sling webs. And this kid is just Elsa. Oh no, 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 wait, wait. And their teacher is just Tom Nook, which is pretty cool. They go on adventures and they find furry bait as well as big ass mosquitoes and shit. Overall, it doesn't seem quite dark given how I've described it. You'd be surprised. Just some of the major plot points of this show are surprisingly depressing and dark. All of the main three cast have some sort of traumatic backstory, which is either just really depressing or just has a large case of what the actual fuck. Misu Miso. I've talked about this one in the past. When you look at Misu Miso, something may look familiar, and I thought the same thing, so let me explain something. Shameless plug aside, I've made a few videos on this channel about fighting games as I'm a big fan of them, and the FGC on a whole. But what does that have to do with this creepy looking manga, you ask? Well, the reason this manga may look familiar is that the same author created this. High score girl. Remember that cutesy anime that got put on Netflix a while back? It's about fighting games and it's by the same dude. But all I can say is, don't expect anywhere near the amount of wholesomeness from this. Misumiso was so creepy, in fact, it got a live action, which is slowly becoming a benchmark for good shows and manga to be ruined on this iceberg. Anyway, Misumiso is the story of this girl who is pretty casually just trying to get through school whilst being bullied by a group of kids from her class. Pretty standard concept from anime and manga as a whole. However, it all changed for this little lady once these said bullies set fire to her house, assuming she was inside. She wasn't, but both her parents and her little sister were though. So you know, they may not have gotten the target, but at least they got a solid triple kill. Triple kill. Oh no, best make that a double kill cause her sister is now in intensive care and could die at any moment. And to be honest, like the image of the sister you see just reminds me of Gorn in the hospital bed, like post adult form, like God damn. This then causes Haruka, the main character, to then go full Batman mode and avenge her dead parents and injured sister. But in more of a Flashpoint Batman way, not like the pussy main timeline Batman. The story basically then revolves around Haruka slowly picking off all of her bullies one by one in the most brutal ways possible. It's pretty dope and the artwork is just really uncanny and creepy. Check it out. Fire Punch. I mentioned the fact that this story would be on this iceberg during the first layer when discussing Chainsaw Man a little bit. Yes, this is from the same author, but instead of the most disturbing things in the story being Makima or the Darkness Devil, the scariest thing in Fire Punch is, well, everyone. <laughs> Ooh, deep. I mean, cults are pretty scary too. And the fact that it literally starts with casual cannibalism on like the fourth page of the first chapter is kind of out of nowhere. Well, I say that, but in the same first chapter, we get a nice sharing of her incest too, with a nice little sprinkle of her genocidal war crimes, which is just, um... Like it's like it's like a lot. It's like a lot at what it's it's a lot. I won't lie. The first chapter it, it throws a lot at you at once, and it comes on really strong. But I kind of love it for it. We continue the series, and we'll get delves into yes, identity, religion, revenge, and the most bad things about the world, and some of the good. I won't lie though, it, it can be a hard manga to get through sometimes because of how cartoonishly gratuitous it can be sometimes when it's trying to convey a message. But at the same time, it's a manga that contains this image, so, you know, take it or leave it at that point. It's one of the edgiest things I've read in a long time, and as a result, it is a very required taste. But if you like it, you'll end up loving it. And just like Chainsaw Man, it has one of the most relatable panels in the entire world. Oh, Yasumi Pun Pun. In the last, like, two or three years, I feel like the popularity of this manga has grown substantially. Like, to an insane degree. And, and that's a good thing. That's great. More people can suffer as I have. In essence, all Oyasumi Pun Pun is, is a coming of age story. The tale of our little friend Pun Pun here. Despite how simple this lovely little bird fellow looks on first glance, this motherfucker has some demons. But overall, throughout the manga, we just see Pun Pun and those around him grow as people. And isn't that just lovely and wholesome? No heinous crimes or actions will ever take place. 
No visual metaphors that portray the act of growing up have ever disturbed me this much. It's, it's great. If you read Pun Pun, you'll remember it. You will follow Pun Pun through his entire life, share his pains, his victories, and when he's sad as hell, as well as when Satan enters the building. Be right back, gotta go to hell now. If you think it's weird that a cartoon bird is the main character, surrounded by normal-ish looking characters, and that god of this universe is just a random Japanese man, well, you just have to kind of read it to get it. Angels of Death, that is an edgy name. All I've got to say about this one is that it takes me back to my youth in a very strange way. And I can tell with just that sentence, I need a little bit of explanation here. You see, Angels of Death is a relative rarity being an anime based on an RPG maker horror game. Quite similarly to Corpse Party, we follow slash play as this lovely girl, Rachel. She has amnesia because of course she does and needs to escape this lovely creepy pasta looking character by the name of Zack. But just for fun, let's call him number four. Zack the Killer. Zack the Killer is a crazy man wielding a scythe. And that's not what you want. He's very spooky and dangerous, but it might be what you get. That was fucking retarded. And she has to escape him by going into a lift and going to the next floor, but then things progress very quickly. Zack vows that he'll be the only one to kill her after they escape and she gets her memories back. Then the two meet different killers on their own personalized flaws. TLDR blonde girl uses Lyft to meet creepypastas to get her memories back. Also, if you couldn't tell, this dude Zack is voiced by Bakugo, so that might be a positive or a negative depending on who you ask. I am a hero. Zombie media has become so oversaturated and boring that it feels really hard to find a piece of the zombie subgenre of horror that is actually scary or disturbing. We've become complacent with this genre. We see zombies, we immediately assume that we could probably survive it. We assume that we could be a hero if this ever happened. But let's be honest, I, I doubt we could. I Am A Hero is a good take on the zombie genre. Compared to a lot of titles in said genre, it's very torn down in regards to scale. No one in the story is taking out hordes of zombies. One zombie is a threat. It's also one of the few live actions that isn't complete dog shit, so you know, that's nice. Also, I'm just gonna say this, or like 11 year old me will never live it down, but hashtag Olympia gang. The story itself is about this dude surviving, that's all you gotta know about it. It's a pretty standard zombie narrative. He's just a uh, Kikomori kind of, well not really, he has a job as a like manga assistant, and then the apocalypse starts and he just tries to survive. Then he starts to think, I am a hero. He said it! He said it! Because, you know, he's all on top of just being a bit of a weirdo, he's schizo as fuck. Yeah, I should have mentioned that, he's, he's proper mental. But, yeah, a zombie apocalypse on your own would make you a bit do lally. But, he's also pretty relatable, not gonna lie. My Chan's Daily Life. This is an old one, an infamous one. So, in a lot of series nowadays, there always seems to be like a character who is immortal or can just like regenerate from any wound, right? We even saw it earlier in Kemono Jihen with this kid. In the real world, what do you think would happen if someone just had the ability to regenerate from any potential wound and couldn't really die normally? Maybe they're short on cash, but have this ability to regenerate like a character from Arjean. What do you think would happen? Well, remember that one weird scene from the boys with that dude who can like regenerate in the motel? Yeah? Imagine that, but even more horny and depraved. And somehow this got a live action as well, and this kind of, it's a bit much. <laughs> Basically the story revolves around my Chan here, who has the quirk of regeneration. And she acts as a maid for depraved people, getting cut apart and other much more unscrupulous things. It's it's pretty much just Goro, or not Garo, not Goro, Guro. Which is some of the most depraved stuff in the world, but hey, it exists, so it's on the list. The reason I don't want to put any panels on screen and why you're pretty much just looking at trailer footage right now is because it it's that graphic and it's you know I really just don't want to talk about this horrendous shit more than I have to because it's just it's not fun it's just 
gore for the sake of gore with no real narrative to it. It's just needlessly gratuitous and graphic. The narrative is pretty much just non-existent, and the therapy isn't worth it. So, it still leaves a question, however. How the fuck did this get a live action? Pupa. If you're a seasoned anime watcher, not even a horror weeb, but just someone who's been around the block a little bit, you may have at some point heard of the show Pupa, because when it came out, everyone immediately recognised how god-awful it was, which is... Don't, it, it is, don't get me wrong. The episodes are like five minutes long, but somehow impressively feel like they're hours long. But despite that, its source material is an entirely different story. I mean, just look at this artwork, like, holy fuck. Basically, the plot of Pupa is that there's these characters in fiction called um, Shitty Dads, and there's one of these here, and also there's these red butterflies. No, not those ones. And what happens is, when someone sees one of those red butterflies, they can immediately turn into flesh-craving monsters. And our main character here, with a sister complex, obviously, has a beautiful little sister that has a sudden craving for flesh. The anime is trash, but just look at this. These manga panels are just horrifying. And then that thing turns back into his little sister. So if she's fed, she remains a little sister. If she's hungry, she turns into this. A dubious little creature getting up to mischief. This is no good. Oh, the beast is demonic in nature. Very icky, no good. The manga goes on for a little while and it gets more disturbing with other butterflies and monsters and more and more corpses. Rabbit Doubt. Rabbit Doubt has a very big place in my heart and over time it feels like it's been forgotten a little bit, which is a shame and quite a shock to me considering that is the literal manga equivalent of Among Us! Basically, there's this mobile game going around on everyone's flip phones. God, I miss flip phones. Basically, they're a group of rabbits. However, there is a wolf hidden among them. I'm not trying to use the word among, I promise. It just fits the situation most. And the wolf will slowly eat all the rabbits one by one, killing them off. The rabbit's goal is to identify the wolf, and every round they have to choose someone to sacrifice who they believe to be the wolf. And if the wolf isn't found out, the game continues. Until either the wolf is gone, or all the rabbits are gone, one or the other. Sounds fucking familiar, doesn't it? It's literally just Among Us! That's why it really shocks me that no one is really talking about it. It also has a little bit of Danganronpa mixed in, so the narrative focuses around these group of people who are trapped in an old warehouse, and they can't escape and are being forced to play Rabbit Doubt, but in real life, with all the murder and sacrifice that the mobile game entails. It has some cool twists and turns, and is a classic, in my opinion, which is obviously completely unbiased. And it also teaches good life lessons and morals, remember that. Boku Rano. People always seem to relate this show to Evangelion a lot, and I'm not gonna lie, I can really see why. What is Evangelion in essence? Kids that are forced into Mecca to try and save the world from goofy ass looking enemies, and on top of that, the show shows the effect of the kids being forced into said Mecca. I mean, obviously that's gonna fuck them up royally. Both of said shows are very depressing, however, Boku Rano has less but biblical imagery in it, and less of, you know, people getting nutted on, which may be a plus or a minus, depending on who you ask. Basically, the way this unfolds is that a group of kids find this Kanto region looking motherfucker in a cave, and he basically asks them if they want to take a part in his game. And all they've got to do is touch this strange object and say their names. And it's as easy as that. They're just enlisted into the mecha military. <laughs> anyway, basically the kids gain control of these big ass mechs and have to destroy all incoming invaders. Simple as that. And nothing could possibly go wrong or get depressing when you put the entire fate of the human race on a group of children. Revenge Classroom. Revenge Classroom as a story is very similar to a couple of other stories that may or may not be on this list and it falls into my personally titled subgenre of horror known as, well, what I titled Bully Revenge Porn, in which a character who gets bullied decides that the bullies have went too far this time and the victim in turn seeks revenge, just like the previously mentioned in this layer, Misa Miso. But with the case of Revenge Classroom, it's a little bit different. We follow this girl, Ayana, I think that's how you pronounce it, who is bullied constantly with violence, threats, cigarette burns, but she silently puts up with it. 
She bites her tongue until one of her bullies pushes her in front of a moving car, nearly killing her. She didn't recognise which bully it was, but as a result decides to go after every single person in her classroom, hunting down everyone who bullied her, as well as those who turned a blind eye. It's a really simple plot, but still a really strong hook, and it's very intriguing. We slowly see her get more and more violent over time. I mean, her first act of revenge is just to have two of her bullies find out that one of them is cheating with the other's girlfriend, but it very much escalates from there. Gantz. I won't lie, out of all the things on this layer, or even on this iceberg as a whole, Gantz is one of the most confusing yet intriguing on this list. At the start, we follow our main character, Kei-chan. No, not that one. Not gonna lie though, for any opening to an anime or manga, this has a strong, strong ass opening in regards to intrigue and confusion. For example, in the first episode, our main character is a dick to an old woman who won't be mentioned later, uh, tries to help a wino off the train tracks with his childhood friend, tries to run away from the train, gets hit by said train and dies, wakes up in a room filled with other people who just died, and then has a naked woman literally spawn on top of him. A random yakuza tries to, uh, <coughs> to said naked woman without consent. The childhood friend protects said woman. Then the perfect sphere in the center of the room that no one acknowledges suddenly starts singing and has text on it saying that it's basically up to the orb what happens to all the people in this room. So yeah, a lot happens very fast and it's such a confusing and mysterious manner you can't help but get intrigued and on top of that there's also plenty of gore just look at what it looks like when people spawn into this room basically the plot turns into this colorful cast of characters having to hunt down aliens hidden on earth things of note about this however is that the anime is from 2004 and was a little bit censored from the manga because the manga is pretty de depraved and st but the anime is still really brutal. I mean, j just look at this. Also, the OP just slaps to me. It doesn't fit the show at all. It genuinely sounds like something from FIFA Street 2 and not an anime uh, that's this brutal. But anyway, trust me, it gets incredibly more disturbing than the concept makes it sound out to be. And things just get weirder and more brutal to the point where I can't show as much as I want to due to the sheer amount of gore in the manga and on top of that the manga is pretty long coming close to like nearly 400 chapters which is longer than bleach <laughs> so you know if you like it there's plenty to go into there's also a weird ps2 game of it that's pretty neat layer 4 i hope you haven't heard of these also as i mentioned in the first layer there won't really be any more or too many anime beyond this point majorly manga left because some of these series aren't very well known enough for a series or just cannot be animated for some reason. I mean, think about it. If a series isn't popular enough, there isn't going to be a reason to animate it. Like, who would watch it? Manga from this point on, pretty much. Anyway, let's dive back into the iceberg. Frank and Fran. Frank and Fran as a series has some of my favourite and most disturbing body horror I have ever seen in any manga series. The main core concept is relatively simple, and is about this lovely girl, aptly enough, named Fran. Side note, I feel like anime and manga, just as a medium, has this strangely niche yet common appreciation for Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is uh, pretty cool. Anyway, this girl is a doctor, and the entirety of the series as a whole revolves around this girl pretty much acting in a very similar way to Black Jack from the series of the same name, in which the Doctor will seemingly save someone's life against all impossible odds. However, Frank and Fran is a twisted version of this. It's kind of an episodic series that has Fran creating a new abomination each chapter. For example, let me paint you a picture of one of the first scenarios from Frank and Fran just to give you a taste. The chapter starts off with a schoolgirl being hit by a truck and almost dying on impact. However, her friend nearby begs for help for anyone who can possibly save her, and Fran decides to step up. Since it was kind of her fault in the first place, she then rebuilds the girl's body, but in the form of something akin to a caterpillar with the girl's head on top. Then Fran reveals that she's pretty much just put her body in a form of chrysalis so that she can just kind of grow herself a new body. I mean, she's not that cruel. She wouldn't just experiment on this poor girl. What kind of person do you think she is? The chrysalis is... 
A huge success! The girl's body is regrown, she then falls in love with the person who called for help, and the town... it, 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 it has a happy ending. The two then go to a love hotel, and as they get to do the dirty deed, she goes full praying madness and eats him. Dope. This is far from the most disturbed story in my opinion. A lot of them I can't even show on YouTube, but I feel like this is the most recognisable because I remember seeing this image a lot back in like the early 2010s. as just like a meme image, but it's still really disturbed. She gives people's eyes that make them see Lovecraftian creatures beyond our imagination, turns people into human dogs, which look that genuinely truly horrify me, a living severed head and just... A hell of a lot more if you're into body horror trust me this is a great read ibitsu ibitsu as a series in regards to horror is pretty short and sweet and from what i remember gained a little bit of notoriety about 10 years ago because i remember seeing this panel everywhere on the internet and still do from time to time before i even read the series it was just everywhere ibitsu itself is a lovely gothic lolita who just appears in random dark alleys asking if you need a little sister. What? You've already got one? D nah, it's cool. This girl is the perfect replacement. Long story short, this girl will try to kill your sister if you've got one, and then try and model you into becoming the perfect big brother using extreme force. It has some pretty good gore, as well as two other short side stories in it that are genuinely unsettling, that have nothing to do with the main story. Like this one about creepy ass mannequins, as well as this chubby lass who pretends to be a manga editor, so her favourite mangakas will draw her OC for her, which is really disturbed, but really interesting. The story itself of, you know, the gothic Lolita, Ibitsu, is a simple but effective one. It doesn't overstay its welcome, being literally like 14 chapters in all, two of which are the previously mentioned side stories, in which we get a backstory for the Lolita girl, as well as a couple brutal kills and investigation, culminating in a couple nice twists that I liked a lot, such as the true nature of her cute plush rabbit, as well as her backstory on a whole as it is only like a 30 minute to an hour read, I'll keep the rest to myself. Give it a shot. And also the artwork is really cool and just how contorted and stylized it is. I, I guess the best way to describe how they portray her movement on panel is fluid. On, like her body it moves like a liquid, it's constantly changing and it just it gets more and more imposing with each panel and it's, it's just cool. I wish I could have this video properly monetized. Bastard. Bastard, the Korean one, not this one, is a series about how this man is irresistible to women somehow. Anyway, we see Bastard's story through this man's son, Jin. No, not that Jin. No, not that Jin either. J Jesus Christ, how many anime and manga characters are called Jin? Wow. So Jin's dad here is a serial killer, and Jin helps his dad with murders out of the fear that if he doesn't help his father he will in turn murder him too in my opinion it's a pretty solid hook and concept for a series right off the bat but as the series well i say a series this is the only manhwa or webtoon whatever you call it on the list spoiler alert no killing stalking boo hoo because i haven't really delved too much into korean manga and comics but out of the couple i have read bastard always stuck with me as having some pretty disturbed and brutal moments and as I said it's one hell of a concept as the story develops we are introduced to Jin's bully Manny no not that one as well as his love interest Kyun Yun thing is though Jin's dad has a very specific taste in women now I wonder what would happen if Pops over here decided he wouldn't mind getting a slice or two on his new girlfriend on top of that, Jin himself was also thrown off a building when he was younger, and as a result developed a heart condition, as well as having a glass eye. So there's a lot of mysteries and plot for there to develop over about 90 chapters or so, and Jin can't seem to catch a break throughout most of it. And on top of that, during a lot of scenes, the artwork is pretty static, and can seem quite middle of the road and like, a lot of the time, to be honest, but for some reason, whenever Jin's dad is in panel, acting all full psycho, I, I don't know, Something about the artwork just seems really uncannily creepy to me and unsettles me in the perfect way. It's a very intriguing read. If you want to give any webtoon a shot or any manhwa, I'd give this a shot. The Drifting Classroom. 
People like to say that Junji Ito is the godfather of horror manga, but whilst he is undoubtedly one of the greats as far as manga is concerned or even beyond that, he was far from the first. Meet Kazuo Umezu. I've, I've butchered that, but so does every native English speaker. And one of, if not his most popular works, is The Drifting Classroom. The plot itself kicks off relatively quickly as we see this little brat buy his mum a new watch. The watch is immediately ran over by a car, he has an argument with his mum over some marbles and then proceeds to go straight to school in a huff, passing one of his friends on the way. Then suddenly, the sign for the school falls to the ground. The ground shakes. So the second child heads towards the school to see if everyone is okay, but they're gone. To be more exact, the, the entire school is gone. We cut back to the cheeky little git from earlier, and he gets to school just fine. Everything seems, you know, hunky-dory enough in the school until a huge earthquake starts. Everyone obviously panics because it's an earthquake, until they realise something's up. They look outside, only you see that the school grounds are now floating in an ocean or something. The classroom is drifting along somewhere in the unknown. I know, hilarious. That's the core concept of the series, the classroom is literally drifting, I get it. While not being anything original for nowadays, this story came out in the early 70s, so this story was pretty much, you know, out there back then. And even by today's standards, this story has plenty of disturbing moments, even right at the start, as well as some genuinely horrifying monsters. The artwork for the monsters does not hold back at all. Dead Mount Deathplay Dead Mount Deathplay is one of those series like Helsing, like Soul Eater from earlier layers on the list where you can argue it's probably not a horror series. And with that, I agree, it's just a relatively dark shonen. To be honest, this iceberg started off as a disturbing anime and manga list, but the title didn't mesh as well. But anyway, Dead Mount Deathplay has a very intriguing plotline. I mean, when I first started writing the script, and making the iceberg, I feel like I placed this in the correct place, like deep down, because I was pretty sure not many people had heard of it. But then I checked, and apparently it's getting an anime adaptation in April, which means it must be pretty popular. So that's cool. I, I guess I should like lower it here, but I'm too lazy to remake that video and redo that script. But anyway, what actually is Dead Mount Death Play? Well, this is a series that starts off pretty stereotypically fantasy scenario in which the hero must defeat a god to save the world but in this case it's the corpse god and both the hero and the god have the ability to see all the souls of people that have been killed surrounding their killer which is some pretty cool imagery someone's soul just forever attached to the person who killed them it's intriguing but with the corpse god's last attack he causes our main character to get transported into our world reincarnated into a young boy's body who's just had their throat slit. Looking around he sees this is a world he dreamed of, a world truly at peace, until the person who slit their throat comes back for more and attempts to finish the job, until it's revealed that our main character who got sent to the quote real world wasn't the hero but in fact the corpse god. He then summons some cool skeletons and fights back from the sounds of it. It doesn't sound very scary. Well, it's not really. The thing is that makes this series come anywhere close to horror are the characters' backstories, some of the gore, as well as just some of the artwork just looking somewhat Lovecraftian, being covered in eyes and protruding appendages. Overall, as a series, it's a shonen slash seinen, you could argue, with some gory artwork and some little glints of Lovecraftian-esque imagery sprinkled in. And I thought it was a little bit underrated, so that's why I put it on the list. Feel free to give it a shot. Jagan. Finally get to talk about Jagan. Jagan is similar to Gantz from the previous layer, which I mentioned, in the sense that it's very outlandish, very gory, very horny, and there isn't a lot of things like the either of them. They're very unique experiences. And just in case you didn't know, the author of Jagan, the writer, also wrote Blue Lock. You know, that's kind of popping off right now, and that's pretty cool. So, yeah, so I had to reread a bunch of Jagan so I could make this section on the iceberg, and I am very happy that I did, as I am a huge fan of this series. So, let me give you the rundown. We follow Jagasaki, a person who hates his life. Great start. He trained his entire life to become a cop so he could, you know, shoot a gun. But since, you know, he's in Japan and not America, he never really got the chance to ever shoot his gun. 
So he gets pissed off at some drunk people who roast him in the street, goes full splinter cell and headshots all of them. Oh wait, he didn't, he just smiles, goes home, shags his bed, fair enough. I can't show it but the man goes in. After all that he goes back to work and frogs randomly start raining from the sky. Shut the f*** up, not like that, you anime only fool. And these frogs are seemingly entering people and making them angry and demon like and stuff called frenzied humans. Cool. Also we see one on a train and our good pal realises he can finally shoot his gun. Oh wait. Well what now? In his last moments he wishes he could have shot his gun just once. Then boom. He grows a, this finger gun. Then an owl shows up and explains that the frenzied humans like he, 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 girlfriend gets infected and he puts her head in the fridge and the owl says he has to defeat all the baddies on his journey I mean the other fraction humans like Jagaki, that's what he is, the fraction human people who don't give in to the evil frogs like this dude who is r slash incel personified because he gains the power of non-consent this dude with a cool mask this dude who is a tree and this person who's an octopus I'm probably just making this sound really really confusing because a lot happens it goes all over the place but in a good way. It is a cool series that displays some beautiful artwork, especially early on. It has very depressing and deeper themes of what it means to be alive, of what it means to be a person, and just, you know, it's just very dark and de depraved at times, especially when concerning this creepy fella. Give it a go if you liked Gans, give it a go if you don't. It has my seal of approval, just feel free. Suicide Island. Suicide Island is a very cool concept for a series, but yet again, not 100% original. But just to explain it more cohesively, I'll just go through the first couple of pages because I feel that they demonstrate the core idea of this series very succinctly. The first chapter starts us off in the emergency room. We see doctors discussing whether or not to save a patient's life. Turns out the patient they're discussing has had several attempts on their own life in the past. But, it's their duties and, you know, oath as doctors to save lives. But, this person doesn't want to live. The patient then gives their consent and asks to die. His life flashing before his eyes. Saying goodbye. Just fading away. Until he wakes up, he sees a vast sea in the distance. Freedom. But then he hears a voice and he sees a girl. How? She looks familiar. He then jolts awake, realising that he isn't dead, seeing only mountainous terrain and forest in the distance. What is this place? Others begin to wake up, more and more people waking up, confused. Including the girl from earlier with a bandage on her wrist. Everyone who woke up begins to gather around a notice board in the distance. The notice board itself states their rights as human beings are gone. They're dead on their home country and as a result have been placed here on this island. Meaning that they have no reason to protect them or have them follow any laws. People who walk up begin to theorise that this is because the cost of saving people's lives who attempt suicide is costing the Japanese government more and more money and as a result created this place, Suicide Island. If that initial hook doesn't get you somewhat intrigued by the mystery of the island, skip it. But this manga does go over some very dark topics. I mean, the it's called Suicide Island, so expect some mature themes. Also, just in case you didn't know, the author of this manga also made Holy Land, which isn't related at all, but it's a really good street fighting manga. Give it a go as well if you've got the time. It's pretty cool if you're in a martial arts manga like Baki and Epo, that kind of stuff. Anyway, Suicide Island, good read. Next one. Kurosaki Corp's Delivery Service. That is a long title, and this is a very adult series. And just to show you how adult, I'll show you the first panel of the manga. Just kidding, I can't, because it starts in the Japanese suicide forest, and we know what that's like on YouTube, because, you know. The narrative itself centers around this group of university students who volunteer to help with corpses. Whether that be this monk dude who hears the spirit's last wishes so they can pass on, and he can also, for some reason, summon this lovely lady. Uh, we have this person who's an embalmer, we have a hacker, because, yeah, and of course we have this person with an alien puppet, because why not? Basically the narrative surrounds this colourful cast of characters as they are called to dead bodies so they can help them pass on, 
clean up the cops, solve their unfinished business, stuff like that. It has some pretty cool gore, and it feels a little episodic a lot of the time, similarly to Frank and Fran from earlier, as we are introduced to new corpses that have new stories to tell, all the while learning more about our cast along the way. Very intriguing, and I suggest giving it a go, but it is over a hundred chapters, so if you like it, there's a good chunk of it. Also, it's very educational in very strange ways. Homunculus. Initially, when I first wrote this segment for Homunculus, I started writing more and more and more and more, till it became more than just a couple hundred words long. And that was me just discussing the first chapter. So just in case I want to discuss Homunculus in the future, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version of the first chapter, whilst giving you a brief rundown of other notable things about Homunculus. The series starts off with this lovely chap catching some sleep in his car until we get a panel of a fetus. It will make sense if you read it, kind of, but I'm not going to explain the fetus now just to confuse you. This man is homeless, technically, living out of his car. His car is his life. It's what separates him from being truly homeless and lesser like the rest of them in the park he comes next to. He talks and is friends with the other homeless people and mostly keeps to himself. However, the homeless people around him recognise that he is a pathological liar, telling each different person a different version of his past. Maybe he worked with cars, or was he a teacher? All the while, someone in the background is spying on him. The person spying on him approaches. They approach with an offer. 700,000 yen in exchange for being used in a trepanation experiment. 7,000 yen? How much is that? Let me google that real quick. Seven. Like four grand? Four or five grand? That, bro, five grand for a fucking drill in my head, are you? Four and a half grand for someone to drill in my head. Hell no. Anyway, for those who don't know, which I unfortunately did for some reason, trepanation is the act of making a small hole in the skull, not damaging the brain. This was used in the dark ages to cure madness, hysteria, stuff like that but nowadays is just kind of used to relieve pressure on the brain when the brain's swollen, stuff like that. The surgery in this context would be done to see if we could unlock this fellow's sixth sense, but that's madness. He's not, go he's not gonna get talked into it, so you know, the manga ends here. So he gets the surgery after his car is taken from him and he needs money to get it back, and as a result of the surgery, he begins to slowly see things. He changes over time, he, he sees homunculi instead of people, when he focuses on the left side of his body. I've glossed over a lot here and trimmed out a lot of stuff just to keep a relative air of mystery and to keep the section somewhat short, but keep in mind this series is very, like, it's as adult as it can get, it's brutally gory, not as brutal as other things, and just an overall mature series, not just in its visuals, tone, themes, and the stuff it shows, but also in just, I don't know, I feel like to really understand it, you have to be a bit older, I guess. Maybe that's naive of me to say. This isn't some goofy stuff like Soul Eater in the first layer. It's got a lot of fluids and a lot of spooky imagery, so whatever. Also, on another note, I feel like this series has become more popular in recent years, as it seems to be trending on social media and stuff, which is cool to see. Give it a shot, it's a, it's a deep read, and some parts of it will disturb you, while others might hit close to home, and Jesus Christ, that ending, what the actual f It just left me speechless, depressed, and overall upset. Like, Jesus, we're, we're on a brighter note, this, this series is where this image comes from, so that's a plus, I guess. This part's not scripted, I'm just going to say this real quick. F for this section, I reread the entirety of Homunculus. I didn't mean to, I was just going to read like the first couple chapters to get like my memories flooding back, but I couldn't remember it, so I read all of it in one night, and oh my god, well, I reread it all in one night, and holy j Jesus Christ, that was, oh my, I don't know how to describe it, it's a, it's a, it's a read, and it's an experience, give it a go, give it a shot. 20th Century Boys. Again, just like Homunculus, this is like another series that has been getting even more popular in recent times due to it becoming popular on social media, which is nice. And on top of that, it was also created by Naoki Urasawa, the dude who made Monster, which was in a previous layer. Anyway, what is 20th Century Boys? If I were to describe it in a single word, 
<laughs> confusing. Uh, I mean, when people are still arguing about the ending of a series 20 years after it started, you, you know you got something a little different on your hands here. To say the least, and you know, it's going to be even weirder, when it was inspired by the Orm Shinrikyo of all things. Now, what does the main plot center around? Well, it centers around a group of kids who spend their days playing pretend and saving the world in their imaginations, crafting a slick, cool, non-cult-like logo in the process. However, when the crew grew older and move on with their lives, the symbol just keeps appearing, most notably in a letter left by one of the group after they commit suicide. We keep seeing a figure surrounded by this symbol, going by the name of Friend, acting as a leader of a cult and claiming that the world is going to end. All throughout this, there's aliens, monsters, music. It, it, it's, it's kind of hard to put this series simply. And it's something you just kind of got to experience yourself because of how just all over the place it is. Yet again, in a good way. There's a reason that this is touted as one of the greatest seinen out there. It's disturbed, it's strange, it's mysterious, and it is one hell of a ride. Pumpkin Night. Pumpkin Night is a series I have covered extensively, to say the least, on this channel. I've even made a full video about it. Check it out if you're curious, but to shorten it a little bit, in essence, Pumpkin Night is very similar to Misa Miso or Revenge Classroom that I mentioned in the previous layers. It's a series about a young person who gets bullied extensively in school and gets revenge. However, in the case of Pumpkin Night, stuff gets brutal. We see how the bullies scarred her face with a combination of fireworks and acid. We see Naoko here cut them apart one by one. We, as the viewer, initially follow Naoko's crush, Kazuya, who acted as a bystander during her bullying and didn't attempt to help her and as a result feels regret about remaining idle in her time of need. After Naoko is permanently scarred by her bullies, she gets sent to an insane asylum by Donald Trump, cool, but then she breaks out and goes on a full killing spree getting revenge on her bullies in some of the most cleverly gory scenes I've seen in a while. If you want more info on the series check out my own video on it but if you don't want to do that, which is fair enough, if you like, as I, the self-titled genre of bully revenge porn, you'll love it. Gorse or brutal, I can't even show it, you'll love it. And you like a good old bit of Trumpage in your anime, this is perfect for you. Side note, why is Trump in so many anime and manga? It is so confusing. Layer 5. Don't tell me how you've heard of these. Dead Tube. Sure, let's start with Dead Tube, why not? The series came out back in like 2015, but it gets more and more real with each day. Anyway, what is Dead Tube? Thankfully, it opens with that exact question and gives us a kind of brief overview. You basically make videos. If a lot of people watch them, you get paid. Sounds nice. <laughs> some people try comedy and emotional stuff, but our apparent heroine of this story here, like some good old fashioned ultra violence. We get a little bit of a monologue complaining about the fantasy of film and how it lacks reality until we then follow our hero or whatever he is, this kid. Not the person who was labelled the heroine two seconds ago, fair enough. Basically, our heroine asks this film club nerd to record her swimming and filming her outside of the pool for some reason. We don't know why, but then it continues to the pool again. We get an epic piss recording scene. Why did I read these? What, Jesus Christ. We go back to her flat, get a full recording of her getting unchanged and showering, because of course we do. The two then eat and then go to sleep. Film nerd thinks about being a nonce and then decides not to. Yippee, I guess. Then the next day, our heroine introduces the film nerd to his old bully. Okay, this is more intriguing, I guess. They're going out. God fucking damn it. The two decide to have a bonding moment inside an old abandoned factory, which isn't suspicious at all. And of course, uh, this... March comes on like a lion looking motherfucker here, has to film it all, and feels the same way I do about the past 30 pages so far, until... Boom. She starts beating him to death with a metal pipe, and to the point where the art turns from gore to something I don't even recognise, like, here is the before and after, like, what even is, I don't even know. Then she finishes the bully off in the murder way, not the other way, and of course our nice film bro gets a nice rod on as a result of watching a murder take place. She swipes his first kiss and you pretty much get the gist of the narrative by now. However, as I said earlier, they get paid for this and the camera guy here got 5 million yen. How much is that in, like, in actual money? 30 grand? 
Fair enough. Sure. Basically, this series is just these two committing borderline guru filming it and then getting lots of money and sexual tension in between. The series gets very depraved and very much on the thinnest edge of becoming a doujin, like ever so close. And then to compensate for that, the series will add a bunch of mature topics and themes to contradict it. In all honesty, I was making jokes throughout this, but this series is like one of the biggest what the f like, it's just confusing and all over the place. Like, how else can I describe this series that has a good chunk of the R word in it, whilst also having a death battle in a steel cage versus a live streaming girl and a Power Ranger wearing a cod piece? Like, which again, of course, this fight scene ends with attempted bruh. The series uses also in a similar way to Mirai Nikki, where it's just kind of thrown out there for shock value, and it did in fact really shock me. I really have no idea how to feel about this one. Would I recommend it? Well, it has like an interesting core concept, but I would really say you should go read something else with more thought into it. Unless you're like okay with gratuitous but sexual themes and violence, as well as an abundance of gore. If you're okay with that and are a little bit morbidly curious, go for it fam. Fort of Apocalypse. When a series pretty much just starts off right on the bat with a Nietzsche quote, you know something weird is about to go down? It gets even more intriguing when we start in a prison. Remember like the last good season of The Walking Dead where everyone's in the prison? Yeah, it's that. These poor dudes are trapped inside of a prison when the zombie apocalypse starts, hence the title, Fart of Apocalypse. Kinda cool title. Far from an original concept, honestly, but it's still a very captivating one nonetheless. Technically, it's not a prison, it's a juvenile reformatory school, but, you know, tomato tomato. It also does this really cool thing where it counts down every prisoner in guard, like, who's left surviving whenever a character dies. Pretty suspenseful stuff. We follow a group of convicted felons roaming across Japan trying to survive and get some guns after they get kicked out of prison by this cool disabled dude who beats people up with his crutches. This is pretty much all you need to know, to be honest. If you're thinking about giving this series a go, it's got some brutal gore. It's a really cool idea by having the zombie apocalypse focus around a prison environment. The only reason I could see a horror fan not wanting to give this a shot is if they're kind of sick of zombies and all the tropes that come with the subgenre. If you feel zombies are getting a bit overplayed and overdone, I'd still say give it a go, like three to four chapters, and if it hasn't grasped you by that point, it won't. But if you're like me and you don't mind zombie stuff from time to time, hey, this is a great zombie manga that's worth the read. Granted, we get some deviations from the standard zombie formula, like the weird naked man who controls all the zombies, all these creepy ass dogs that smile like the spawn of Satan. But overall, it's a zombie manga at its core. Kinda similar to Left 4 Dead in a weird way. Mostly zombies, but with special infected and some funny moments sprinkled in on top of the calamitous state of the world destroying the character's psyches. Oh, and also a little PS here. I love it when zombies do this in media, but the zombies can also sometimes talk, and I love that stuff. So, yeah, it's pretty good. If you want a zombie manga read, give this a go. Hakaiju. Hakaiju is a series with some genuinely unsettling monster designs and themes, and that is pretty well encapsulated in the series' first couple pages. Just look at this! What the fuck? What? Is this slam dunk? It continues and we get butt slapping. Guy, a guy butt slapping's really gay. Cause one of the main characters finally stops being a bench warmer and gets on the team. Quickly followed by these two characters becoming love rivals for this one girl called Miku. Can't argue with that. Then immediately an earthquake happens cause it's Japan. And then main character Kun loses consciousness for a little while and is just kinda out of it. But when he comes to, the only thing left of his love rival is a single arm, meaning that Mika was off the Taken baby. Not that our pro tag Akira will ever get the chance to see her since he sees evil monster hands from the shadow dimension about to eat him. He locks himself in the sports cupboard and tries to piece together what's happening. Then he realises his phone in the other room will probably be his only way to survive. But when he tries to grab it, he accidentally gets a much better look at the monster from before. I love the artwork here and designs of everything creepy, but why does this creature have to be so veiny? It gives me major Mara vibes from Persona. Don't like that. He, he tries to run away from the creature and stumbles upon a room of viscera, where a bunch of people were ripped apart. This scene, like the rest of the series, has some blur, brutal gore here. There is one survivor, however, who pleads with Akira to find his legs. But upon further inspection, we see that the creature from before is chowing down on the survivor's lower half. Some more running ensues until we find an actual survivor hiding under a mountain of corpses. 
Then the monster attacks again. The two survivors end up escaping the school, only to finally get outside and see the full scale of the monster. They, like the rest of Japan right now, are kind of bored, you know? They try to call for help, no signal, so they try looking for help. They find this nice woman. They get introduced to a new monster, who in turn politely pushes the woman out of the way with his blade hands. As the plot unravels, we are introduced to more survivors of this incident, and the story begins to revolve around who are these survivors, what are they capable of, but most important of all, where did these monsters even come from? If you like a little bit of mystery, some heavy gore, and some absolutely grotesque monster designs, and some overall impressive artwork, give Hakaiju a try. Killing Moth, same author as the creator of Pumpkin Knight. Masaya Hokazono. However, it seems that the main author of this manga, the aforementioned Hokazono, loves to change illustrators between each of his stories. That's why some of his manga have very different art styles and art quality, to be honest. But there is one thing I must mention when discussing the next couple series, as a couple of them are created by this same author. I am very biased and I love his work, despite one major flaw. The author loves to either simply stop writing his stories, or just end it terribly. Like, this story in particular is really bad for it. I know I'm kind of painting this story in a negative light already, but I'll explain a bit about it so you don't just write off this story as just a bad ending, right? But just keep in mind that this story just kind of ends, and I doubt it's ever going to get continued. Just like Fall of Apocalypse, we start with a famous quote. How cool. However, this time, the quote is from a little known fella by the name of uh, Ted Bundy, because why wouldn't it be? The story basically centers around two characters, this girl and this killer. After a day trip of puppy staring, the girl goes for a walk about with her friends until the bombastic bagman appears. He starts just randomly attacking everyone in sight and is about to get our girl here, but then he just walks straight past her. Why? Then he quickly changes his mind, but gets arrested before he can do anything. She then keeps seeing visions of this killer everywhere, but ignores it and logically comes to the conclusion that she just has PTSD from seeing people being butchered, which makes sense, until she sees him in her bedroom and then quickly disappears. But this time he left boot prints on her bed. So we then follow this girl as she realizes that she's seemingly being hunted down by a teleporting serial killer that can appear in front of her at any time. Now, that's one hell of a premise. We find out about the killer himself, a little bit about what's under his mask, why he let her live, we find out bits and pieces of the story. But then it just kind of stops, unfortunately. It's a good ride, and it just kind of has an abrupt halt, which is unfortunate, but hey, it's good while it lasts. So keep that in mind. Emerging. Another series from the same author, Masaya Hokazono. I know I said I didn't want a bunch of stories from the same author, like with Junji Ito in like the second or third layer, but these stories are so drastically different from one another and all have different artists and are just kind of written by the same person so I'll give it a pass. I mean the only thing that the previous stories from this author have in common is pretty much just brutal gore. Thematically they're all very different. Anyway, emerging. The world today, for good reason, is more afraid of disease and infection than it has ever been since like the bubonic plague era. So why not read a story that capitalizes on that fear of illness? The plot of emerging is pretty goddamn simple. So this will probably be one of the shorter sections on this layer. Basically there's this disease getting passed around throughout Japan that is quote unquote even worse than Ebola. What it does is after infection it makes you bloated and start bleeding from your eyes, ears and nose and then your eyeballs melt and you just kind of pop and it gets spread easily so Japan kind of turns into a big ass game of dominoes if you used balloons instead as everyone starts popping. The core of the narrative focuses on a group of doctors trying to cure the disease as the disease becomes more and more widespread, all the while struggling to find a cure. The main draw of this series is seeing how characters struggle after becoming infected and how easily it spreads to others. On top of that, seeing people's eyes melt out of their skulls whilst they bleed like stuffed pigs and then being dissected after makes for some interesting gore. It's relatively short too, so don't hesitate to give this one a read. It does have a couple strangely funny moments there as well. Freak Island slash Awful Island. Final story from Mr. Hokazono here, but I hear you. Why so many stories from this one dude? Why you ask? Why not? Every other iceberg or top 10 list always has one series per author, including my own, but I kind of think it's stupid to be honest. Anyway, Freak Island itself is also known as Kichi Kujima. 
It is a manga. I may love even more so than Pumpkin Knight. It starts off pretty interestingly, to be honest. It starts off with a quote. What the fuck is it up with all these quotes, Jesus? We see a girl instead in a bear trap. She looks out to the sea and thinks about how close she is to freedom. Until a large man with a pig head brings a machete down across her arms as she pleads, taking her fingers off in the process. He then suckles on the wounds left on said injuries and proceeds to bring his blade down once more to finish the job. This pig-headed fella looks towards the sea and notices a yacht on the shore, sacrifices for Santa Maria. From this little intro, you'd probably assume this fella is somewhat inspired by Bubba from Texas Chainsaw, and you'd be absolutely right. This narrative is basically manga Texas Chainsaw, with some more culty imagery as well as a sprinkle of Lovecraftian horror and a dash of Christian imagery. It's majestic. It's kind of hard to delve into more detail about this one because it's kind of long running for this author and a lot of stuff happens over the course of about 120 chapters or so. And it's still ongoing. There's a lot of kills, a lot of gore, a good helping of cannibalism and a cool killer family to boot. Out of all of these on this specific layer, this is one I'd probably say is one of my favourites. Also, the reason I put Freak Island slash Awful Island in the segment is because Awful Island is a prequel that's just as brutal. And a little side note, the volume covers for these manga, oh my god, they're magnificent, like Jesus Christ. It's an absolutely wild ride, but it takes a while for chapters to still come out, so if you like it, you'll love it. If you read five chapters and don't like it, stop, because it just spirals and it's becoming weirder and weirder as it goes on. Starting out as standard horror fare about trying to escape the island of this cannibal family, but it just becomes absolute batshit mental over the course of these chapters. P.S. The reason this segment may sound a little bit different from the other segments is because a dog was barking outside my window and I didn't notice till I checked the recording. Sick. Anyway, next one. Tokyo Red Hood. The reason this one is on this list is because I remember an old, old ass anime man video recommended it and he said it was really disturbing so a younger me decided to read it and I remember reading it when I was really young and it just I just kind of glanced through it, not really thinking about it, and it didn't seem like anything special to me. I didn't really remember much besides it being like a little bit disturbing. Good to know. I'm thinking of things to put on this iceberg, and I remember this old chestnut. So I started to reread to see if it was worth putting on the iceberg, and well, this one's kind of like my chance daily life in a sense. Well, in the sense of, yeah, sure, there is in fact a narrative here, granted more so than my chan but it still feels as if the narrative is just here to create reasons for the mangaka to put horrific and PTSD inducing images on screen, or well, on page, as frequently as possible. And unlike my chan it's not so much the gore that disturbs me, it's the fact that Little Red Riding Hood here is like 10, and the manga starts off with her having a gunfight in a love hotel just after she did stuff with an old man. And it's all there, it's all on panel, naked and all. It's not my cup of tea, but I hate the fact that after you skip this shit there is a somewhat intriguing concept underneath but it's not worth sitting through this crock of lolly shit to read it i can barely put any panels on screen because it's that gratuitous constantly it pisses me off because there's some genuinely cool imagery in this sometimes but i just couldn't read through all of it it just gets really noncy i don't like it like the idea of like little red riding hood only wanting to be killed by the wolf and also being like immortal and unkillable by anyone except the wolf and the wolf is like also her son. It's intriguing, right? In the very least. But I'm not going to sit through this nasty ass stuff that I can't even show. Overall, don't read this unless you want to end up on a watch list. And if you ever hear someone defending it, give them a slap. Suicide Boy. I kind of lied, well, more so forgot. We got more Korean stuff on this list, even though I said there wasn't going to be any more. With a title like Suicide Boy, you'd assume it's pretty hardcore. Well, it's in the genres of slice of life and comedy, so uh, I think I've got some explaining to do. Suicide Boy is like two separate entities, I guess. One, like an old school webcomic that's just a bunch of black comedy shorts, followed by the second thing, which is the actual series, which has a long running narrative. Both of which have very dark themes, despite the fact that I use the word comedy to describe it. It's also a webtoon, like the previously mentioned bastard from an earlier layer. We follow Lee Hun. Lee Hoon? I, I don't know. Lee. A 70 year old high school student who wants to die. Shocker. Both his parents are dead, he's left with an unbreakable debt, and he's a homebody. He's three months late on rent and hiding from his landlord. I mean, the first thing we see him do is a little tutorial on how to make a rope less irritable for when you're hanging yourself. And every time he's stressed out, he starts 
cutting himself and that just completely juxtaposes with the cutesy art style that makes it very strange to read. It's a very different type of disturbing to the other stories on this list. Like in the first couple chapters, each chapter is just him attempting to use a different tool to commit suicide. He tries a knife, he cuts too deep and throws the knife away because it hurt him too much. He tries to hang himself and then panics and cuts the rope. Like self-harm and suicide is played for laughs in this series in a very peculiar way. Not necessarily in a disrespectful way though, but seemingly more like the author was using this as kind of like an outlet for someone who's felt this way in the past. Like the sudden cutting being played for jokes at certain inconveniences. As someone who knows a good chunk of people who've done similar acts, it's, it seems quite real despite the almost chibi art style. He gets bullied, makes friends, and people try to stop him from committing um, hero. It's, it, it's a very strange read, but it has some genuinely funny bits and pieces in there, but at the same time focuses on a genuinely depressing topic that just doesn't shy away from showing. Side note, one of the funniest moments in this series to me is when there's a full ass scene where a couple of characters go to an arcade, but since the character has no money, they want to keep playing at the arcade cabinet so he can't lose, because if he loses, he can't play anymore. So he has to stoop to guile turtling or guile waiting when he's playing Street Fighter and it fully explains this tactic in depth for zero reason and I love that so much. It's it's great. It's been a while since I feel like I've read something so genuine and true to how the author was feeling at the time they wrote it. Give a couple chapters a read if you find it funny or intriguing. Keep reading. There are some wholesome moments in there over the course of 134 chapters. Me and the Devil Blues. This series is a strange one. If you're a fan of old school blues music, this is right up your alley. And if you like cool art styles, same again. This is a story that is kind of based on a real world legend. One of the first ever blues musicians was a man named Robert Johnson. Now what's intriguing and manga worthy about this man's story is that the legend goes as such. That one night at a crossroads in Clarksdale, Mississippi, Robert Johnson went. And for those who are uninformed in the ways of the occult, it is said that crossroads are supernatural and act as somewhat of a gate between our world and the world of the dead. Robert Johnson went to this crossroad and he made a deal with the devil himself, or so the story goes. It's said that he sold his soul in exchange for him to be one of the best guitarists there ever was, so he could reach fame and fortune with music. And for a time, he was one of the best and most prolific musicians of his time, until his death a short while afterwards when he died at just the age of 27 due to an unknown cause. Oh, so the legend goes. The title itself is named after one of Johnson's songs of the same name that discusses the devil walking side by side with him. The manga aims to retell this story and show us what may have happened in Robert Johnson's story if such a deal did truly exist. It has some glorious imagery. It has a couple of problems, but overall, this is a very intriguing package tied into a real world figure that really caught my attention. If you're a big music geek or if you just like the trope with the deal of the devil or like a monkey's paw type story, you'll love this. MPD Psycho. MPD Psycho is an intriguing manga as at its core it is a mystery with some brutal gore and very mature themes. As soon as you read the first chapter, the adult nature of this manga will slap you like a sack of bricks. We start off with this man's inner monologue, questioning his own identity as he sees someone who looks exactly like him on a TV screen. Who am I? We are then met with a courtroom. A final verdict is about to fall upon the defendant, one Yosuke Kobayashi, to which the defendant doesn't move, claiming that he is not Yosuke Kobayashi, he is in fact Kazuhiko Amamaya. That's literally the first few pages of the manga, and I'm not gonna lie, I remember when I originally read this series, I was dragged into the plot immediately. The, the story keeps flashing back to the events leading up to this, and flashing forward to Kobayashi or Amamaya in prison. And flashing back, we see Kobayashi as he tracks down a murderer who has been dismembering people and stringing their bodies up. He has nightmares about seeing himself murder someone else. He talks to his girlfriend about it, investigates some more, and heads back to the office. When he's leaving, he's given a package, a large ice cooler. The cooler is opened and contains his girlfriend inside with all her limbs removed. Still alive, however, the killer, after seeing Yosuke on TV, grew infatuated and tracked down his girlfriend as a result. He gets her to a hospital and sees her before going to track down her attacker. Upon finding him, the killer speaks, saying that the two are the same. Both are killers, both are psychopaths. If he's annoyed, just kill him. The killer, Shimazu, proceeds to brag about how he put the detective's girlfriend in a mixture of formalin and polyethylene glycol. So she survived. The detective's face changes. Shimazu questions if he was wrong, and his girlfriend died. Then he realises she didn't die. 
the detective killed her. When visiting her in the hospital, the detective shoots Shimazu in the leg and has arguments with people who are there. It's becoming clear to both of us and the killer that this detective has more than one person inside of his head and without a second thought he proceeds to shoot the killer in the head and do so with a wide grin. But this act has done something else. It killed both Shimazu, the killer, and Kobayashi, one of the detective's personalities. He is now Kazuhiko Amamaya. This is the first two chapters, by the way, and it probably sounded like a lot happened. There are 123 chapters of this, but there are a few things that do annoy me about it. Firstly, when he goes to prison, he gets sentenced to X years in prison. I'm not a mathematician, but if Mega Man is anything to go by, X amount of years is a long ass time. And the fact that this person's major personality we get any sense of depth from is called Kobayashi. And whenever I read that word, I just hear it like this. Kobayashi. Ugh. That's it kind of annoys me, but that's just like coincidence. That's not the, the manga's fault. Overall, MVD Psycho is a very interesting series, especially to horror fans and fans of crime and thriller. As we don't just focus on this character, oh no, we move on to other characters, other mental instabilities, and all throughout we get some really brutal gore. Like, goddamn. Give it a shot, it's got my seal of approval. Shamo. Shamo is a fighting manga at heart. Well, why have I put a manga about martial arts and fighting that seemingly has more in common with a manga like Tepu or Baki than most things on this iceberg? Well, it starts off with the main character murdering his parents in cold blood, but it doesn't stop there, folks. He immediately gets sent to prison, gets Zui Wheel Chest brutally by multiple prisoners. Then, when the same prisoners try to do it again, Ryo, our main character and recent victim, bites his attacker's cock off. Then Ryo gets a cell to himself, since he clearly doesn't work well with others. After that, a karate sensei comes to the prison for the sake of exercise and to teach the prisoners discipline. And in the process, our friend Ryo becomes entranced by karate, karate, or however you pronounce it. He continues to get tortured by the other prisoners due to his crimes and due to him seeming weak, till he stabs and beats the shit out of one of his tormentors. Then his sister visits him and tells him basically everything in her life came crashing down as soon as he murdered the two's parents. And now she has to just be a sex worker just to survive. So you know, this dude's life is pretty much not ideal at the moment. But the only thing that keeps him alive both mentally and physically is martial arts. Physically to protect himself from the other prisoners and mentally just to keep himself sane. The story progresses from him having prison fights with his attackers after a year of training, him leaving prison, trying heroin with a prostitute, working for the mob, and then just trying to become the best fighter in a new league called Lethal Fights. Quite similar to Baki, the series is almost 300 chapters deep, so you can see the artist's style evolve over time. Also, it does the same thing as Epo, where to explain how characters feel about certain situations, it will make great use of visual metaphors, which I love. If you like martial arts and fighting manga, but you want it to be 10 times darker than the other stuff, give Shamo a go. There's not much else like it. Doku Mushi. Yet another series that I just kind of feels like an excuse to draw messed up stuff, while also unfortunately having an interesting concept that is wasted on it. Doku Mushi means poisonous insect and kind of also refers to an old ritual where you'd get like a bunch of poisonous insects and put them in a pot, seal it and leave them to starve. Then you come back days later, open up the pot and the only insect left in the pot will be the most poisonous after consuming all the other insects that were trapped inside. Now, do that with people, and there you go, you have Dokumushi. We basically got a group of people locked in an abandoned school for a week, and they pretty much have to eat each other to survive. So it's basically rabbit doubt with a lot less thought and a lot less tact, and just more gratuity without any merit. This series has, for no particular reason, themes of a little list here nonces, cannibalism, toddler murder, sexual violence. Why does this series cover such serious topics? I have no idea. To be honest, the series just feels like messed up fetish shit that I'm not really into. Just like my chan and Tokyo Red Hood. And on top of that, I say it's an interesting concept, but it's not. Because the main crux of the plot is that they're trapped for a week, but they can just wait it out. The human body can survive for like a month only on water, and they have water. So what's the actual point? The series may have interesting moments, like there's some decent gory scenes that I can't show, and but there's so much pointless gratuity that it, it, it's just whack. Yet again, like the other series that I mentioned, maybe there was something here, but it's ruined by the constant fetish stuff. Skip it. Sure, it's disturbing, but not everything on this iceberg is a recommendation. Some of the things on this list are just kind of here for the sake of informing you about these series so you don't waste your time on them. This, like my channel, like Tokyo Red Hood, it just feels like fetish shit with gore on top. It's just wasted potential. However, the only good thing to come up this manga is this panel because it makes me fucking giggle and it's very amusing. That's it. Starving Anonymous. 
Now this is how you do a manga to disturb with actual thought into it. This manga is messed up in the most perfect way. This manga starts off with some chicken nugget eating, nice, which is quickly juxtaposed by the main character's friend, describing how chicken nuggets are actually made in real life. It's pretty grim, I won't lie, but good eating is good eating. Main character gets on the bus, immediately gets knocked out on said bus, wakes up in a facility where corpses are being sorted, he gets put on a truck and thrown in a room filled with humans connected to feeding tubes, which are all enormous. Basically, the main story revolves around a human facility called the Cradle, where humans are fattened up with these tubes that just make them addicted and fat. And once the humans are fattened up enough, they get fed to these horrifying mantis hybrids that are absolutely petrifying. Humans are bred and fed like cattle so that they can be consumed by these creatures. And these are all led by one giant one of these fellas who lives in a massive throne room. It runs so deep into the government that these creatures just casually kill the Japanese Prime Minister for no reason. The series is creatively and brutally gory, has an intriguing plot, and has artwork that just makes you uncomfortable when looking at it. If these creatures want human meat, why not try to create a human that can regenerate meat so they have infinite meat to eat? As a result, there's also this dude in the facility who can regenerate from any injury. Ironically enough, like my chan except he's not an absolute pussy. So if he gets stuck in a fight, he'll rip out his own ribs to use as a weapon. And he wants to kill the insect overlord alien thingies, so he's pretty cool. I suggest reading this if you're into body horror and you like monsters with some creative designs, as well as this creepy motherfucker who looks like the G-Man and puts people through surgery in the same kind of way Frankenfran does. Granted, this character is 10 times worse. This dude is truly horrifying. Not much more I want to say about it besides I love the premise and is one of the most discomforting things to read in the most perfect way possible. And on top of that, the yeah, art is pretty sick when it's not absolutely sickening. Ichi the Killer. This, despite being on the bottom there, has an OVA, which is uh, an uncomfortable watch to say the least. If you've heard of Ichi the Killer, it's probably from the live action movie from a few years back that gained a little bit of notoriety in the last couple years as a few YouTubers covered it and analysed it. Well, I'm here to say that the OVA and the manga are a lot worse in a thematic sense. They're more depraved and overall more deranged, but in an enjoyable way, I guess. All I care about is the fact that this section will be a million times easier to edit because I won't have to keyframe all the images. Anyway, this story revolves around Ichi here. Ichi, if you didn't know, is the number one in Japanese, if you couldn't tell. And he is a bit messed up in the head. He smiles a bit funny, he's awkward around people, he gets bullied, and he kills people and jacks off over their bodies. So, there's that. The way I've worded it, I make him sound like a mindless serial killer. Technically he is, but he's more like a contract killer. He's a bunch of like ex-Yakuza, hire him out to kill gang leaders and people like that so they can steal their money. The OVA kind of acts like a prequel to this, showing us what Ichi was like before he became a killer, when he was just being bullied at school. And the live action movie is just like something else entirely. It's got some brutal gore, some cool kicking, and a very intriguing main character that makes you morbidly curious. If you want a story about a psychopath who loves all forms of violence, who pretty much has the mind of a child, hey, give it a read, or give the OVA a watch. But to be honest, after consuming the manga, the OVA and the live action, the live action feels very disconnected from the original series, though still a cult classic. So I suggest the OVA and the manga more so than the live action, but if you do like one, you'll like the others. Hazureta Mina no Atama no Neji. I won't lie, I have literally zero idea how I came across this series. With every other mention on this list, I kind of pinpoint where I heard about them. Maybe from a friend, from an article, a YouTube video, randomly picking it up when I look for a manga. But with this one, I have no clue as to when I first heard of it. I'm making it sound a lot more deep and mysterious than it is, but I just felt the need to say that before I went any further. This series has a couple names. Hazureta Mina no Atama no Neji, as I said, or Everyone's Loose Screw, or the last sane person in this crazy town. The plot revolves around this girl, Misaki, as she notices everyone in her town has gone insane. Pretty apt given the series' titles. She theorises that maybe it's due to a nearby transmission tower and that it may be affecting her as well. However, she has a surefire method of proving that she's not crazy. Telling this capybara-headed demon that suddenly appeared in her bedroom why everyone else in the town is more crazy than her. If I had to describe this series, I'd say it's kind of like an Ito-esque series of short stories with a black comedy twist. A comedy coming from the outlandish situations and a pretty unassuming art style, but the horror comes from seeing how crazy the people of the town actually are. It's pretty episodic, each chapter is its own little story, usually about one person in the town interacting with Misaki, and it's a pretty interesting title to read. 
I'd give it a go if you like a little bit of dark comedy from time to time with a bit of an Ito twist. And it's only got like 20 chapters out, so it's a pretty quick read too. As this iceberg took months to finally finish, there were obviously quite a few titles I couldn't add due to time constraints that I would have liked to. So in this added little section at the end here, I'm just going to talk about a few horror anime and manga that you should watch or read if you have the time. That I would have put on the iceberg but simply didn't do with time constraints. But bear in mind this section is going to be a lot less scripted. Well, it's just unscripted. Number one, Doro Hedero. Read that. It's great. It's it's my favourite of Q Hayashida's stuff. And she's done Doro Hedero, obviously. She did all the concept art for Shadows of the Damned. Pretty cool stuff. Doro Hedero in particular is like, uh, how do I explain it? Uh, take like creepy, weird, dank, disgusting world building and then add magic and then add the same kind of character as Kaneki where there's like 12 dudes inside him. There you go. Doro Hedero. Sick. Main character is a dude with a crocodile head. For a while anyway. Sick. Doro Hedero. Now Dororo. Same syllables, different story. Take a character with no eyes, nose, limbs, skin, any ears, can't do nothing but you can still see demons and he kills demons. To get like his limbs and senses back. Pretty cool. Pretty sick. Watch the remake. I'd say because the older version from like the 50s and 40s is really, really outdated. Well, not outdated. It's just you have to like and appreciate that older art style. Certain characters talk when they when they don't in the new. It's they're very different. I'd suggest the new version if you like the new version a lot. Go back and read the old version. Killing stalking. I mentioned it in part three, part four. Killing stalking. Okay, I like it, but. There's certain people in this world who don't understand it and misconstrue it in the worst way. Like, some people treat killing stalking as a romance. How? How do you do that? Like, like killing stalking as a psychological horror, manga, yeah, webtoon, like Korean manga is great. It's a great thriller. But at the same time, the fandom surrounding it is abominable. Like, they think it's a romance. How? If you want a great psychological thriller, read it. But like, just don't interact with anyone else who's read it. <laughs> Dead Man Wonderland. I'm surprised I've never talked about Dead Man Wonderland like ever. Like maybe in like offhandedly commented on about it. But it's like one of my favourite series. It's one of the few series I have all of. And I love Dead Man Wonderland. Dead Man Wonderland, great. It's a great mystery, cool power system. F fucked up amusement park. It's a really cool story. People control their own blood. There's fucking, oh, there's this dude who's basically just Kenpachi, but he's called Crow. It's a pretty cool guy. Basically, Demon Wonderland is like a, in a theme park where they take prisoners and they make them do like death. Like, they, <laughs> I can't believe I thought that. They it basically take a bunch of prisoners, make them play Fall Guys in real life, and then there's a second layer, like underground, where you take those same prisoners, but they can control their own blood and they have death battles. It Just watch the anime, there's 12 episodes. If you like it, read it. Because, and don't just like carry on from where you watched because they cut out a lot of stuff in the first season because they didn't think it was going to get a second and it didn't. So, read it. It's, but, it's pristine. Wholesome ending, too. And quite the opposite of Dead Man Wonderland, Promised Neverland. Great series. Terrible fucking ending. Anyway, Promised Neverland, if you're going to watch it, watch the first season, skip the rest, don't watch the second season. Is there a third season? I don't even remember. Probably not. Shouldn't be. But basically, Promised Neverland, one of the best fest seasons ever. Same with the manga. It starts off really strong, but then the second season dies off because the second season removed my favourite character in the entire series. I forgot his name because it's been a while since I read it, but he was great. He's just gone. Anyway, Promised Neverland, basically, kind of like Starving Anonymous, where, like, people are grown as, like, cattle and bred to be eaten. That similar sort of scenario. But instead of, like, them being attached to feeding tubes, it's more like a free-range farm. And instead of being fed to massive cockroach weird fucking uh, alien thingy with jiggies they're getting fed to demons instead so it's basically starving anonymous is a better promised neverland but promised neverland still has its moments just don't expect a good ending <laughs> don't expect it to end well yeah there's, a, there's plenty of other series i could talk about like i've literally got a list of the ones that i might make videos on in the future like the manga for all boy magical girl sight uh redo of healer because jesus christ that is a story jin man uh, gaju witch's house there's a bunch of like lists of titles here that i wanted to put on the iceberg but i just didn't have time so that's why this little section's for i may make like a longer video where i go through all the manga and say where they would be on the like on the iceberg anyway i'll draw time <laughs> thank you so much for sticking with this with this iceberg like you've watched all of it that's amazing thank you all again thank you all for the support i know it's been like 10 months 
nine, ten months since the original first layer was uploaded. And it took me months and other videos like being released until it was finished. And this is the finished product. Thank you so much for the support on the channel. Thank you so much for watching these videos and any of my videos actually. Just really appreciate it. Thank you for the support and join us my videos. We'll see you next one. Peace.